Legendary Passages, Episode 112 The Poems of Catullus, Part 1 of Poem 64 Of the Argonauts and Ariadne Previously, Princess Ariadne was abandoned by Theseus on the island of Naxos. In this passage, we revisit how she came to be stranded there. Now the structure of this poem is quite odd. It begins with the voyage of the Argonauts, where Prince Peleus fell in love with the mermaid goddess Thetis, and Jupiter, king of the gods, approved of the marriage. The people of Peleon Thessaly abandoned farm and field, and gathered at the palace for the wedding of the hero and goddess. It is here that Catullus describes a magnificent purple and ivory couch, decorated with images of an unkempt Ariadne standing half-dressed on shore's edge, watching Theseus row off without her. Then, as an aside, a summary of how they came to meet. Her brother Androgeus slain, Athens plagued by the gods, and the young boys and girls due to Minos as tribute, for which Theseus volunteered. It was love at first sight for Ariadne, she gave him the thread to escape from the labyrinth, so that they could live together happily ever after. But fate had other plans for them. Of the Argonauts and Ariadne A legendary passage from A. S. Klein Translating Gaius Valerius Catullus Part 1 of Poem 64 Of the Argonauts, and an epithalium for Peleus and Thetis. Once, they say, pine trees born on the heights of Pelion floated through Neptune's clear waters to the river Phasis and Aetes borders with chosen men, oaks of the Argive people, hoping to steal the golden fleece of Colchis daring to course the salt deeps in their swift ship, sweeping the blue waters with fir-wood oars. The goddess herself, who guards the heights of the city, who joined the curving fabric to pinewood keel, made their ship speed onwards with light winds. That vessel was first to explore the unknown sea, so... As she ploughed the wind-blown waters with her prow, And whitened the churning waves with foam from the oars, The Nereids lifted themselves from the dazzling white depths of the sea, Amazed at this wonder of ocean. And those, and other days, mortal eyes saw the sea-nymphs Raise themselves, bodies all naked, as far as their nipples from the white depths. Then Peleus, they say, was inflamed with love of Thetis. Then Thetis did not despise marriage with a mortal. Then Jupiter himself agreed to Thetis's marriage. O heroes, born in a chosen age, hail, godlike race. O offspring of a blessed mother, hail once more. Often I'll address you in my song. And I addressed you, so blessed in your fortunate marriage, chief of Pelion Thessaly, to whom Jupiter himself, creator of gods, yielded his beloved. Did not Thetis possess you, loveliest of myriads? Did not Tethys allow you to lead off her granddaughter, and Oceanus, who embraces the whole world with sea? When at the time appointed the longed-for flames arise, all of Thessaly crowds together to the palace. The halls are filled with a joyful assembly. They bring gifts with them, declaring their joy in their looks. Sieros is deserted. 
They leave Fithiotic Tempe, Cranian's houses, and Larissa's walls. They gather in Pharsalia, crowd under Pharsalia's roofs. No one farms the fields, the necks of bullocks soften, nor does the curved hoe clear beneath the vines, nor does the ox drag earth onward with the blade, nor does the sickle thin the shade of leafy trees. Coarse rust attacks the neglected plow. But the palace gleams bright with gold and silver through all the rich receding halls. The ivory chairs shine, cups glisten on tables, the whole palace gladdened with splendor of royal wealth. In the midst of the palace a sacred couch, truly joyful for the marriage of the goddess, gleaming with Indian ivory, stained with the red dyes won from purple murex. The cloth depicts in ancient forms with marvelous art, in all their variety, the excellence of gods and men. Here are seen the wave-echoing shores of Naxos, Theseus aboard his ship, vanishing swiftly, watched by Ariadne, ungovernable passion in her heart, not yet believing that she sees what she does see, still only just awoken from deceptive sleep, finding herself abandoned wretchedly to empty sands. But uncaring the hero fleeing strikes the deep with his oars, casting his vain promises to the stormy winds. The Minoan girl goes on gazing at the distance, with mournful eyes, like the statue of a peccant. Gazes, alas, and swells with great waves of sorrow. No longer does the fine turban remain on her golden hair. No longer is she hidden by her lightly concealing dress. No longer does the shapely band hold her milk-white breasts, all of it scattered, slipping entirely from her body, plays about her feet in the salt flood. But, not caring now for turban or flowing dress, the lost girl gazes towards you, Theseus, with all her heart, spirit, and mind. Wretched thing! for whom bright Venus reserved the thorny cares of constant mourning in your heart. From that time when it suited warlike Theseus, leaving the curving shores of Piraeus, to reach the Cretan regions of the unbending king. For then, forced by cruel plague, they say, as punishment to absolve the murder of Androgeus, ten chosen young men of Athens and ten unmarried girls used to be given together as sacrifice to the Minotaur, with which evil the narrow walls were troubled until Theseus chose to offer himself for his dear Athens, rather than such Athenian dead be carried undead to Crete. And so in a swift ship and with gentle breezes he came to great Minos and his proud halls. As soon as the royal girl cast her eye upon him with desire, she whom the chaste bed nourished, breathing sweet perfumes in her mother's gentle embrace, even as Eurotas's streams surrounded a myrtle that sheds its varied colors on the spring breeze, she did not turn her blazing eyes away from him till she conceived a flame through her whole body that burned utterly to the depths of her bones. Ah, sadly, the boy incites inexorable passion in chaste hearts, he who mixes joy and pains for mortals, and she who rules Golgus and the leafy Idalia, and she who shakes the mind of a smitten girl, often sighing for a blonde-haired stranger. How many fears the girl suffers in her weak heart! How often she grows pallid, more so than pale gold! As Theseus went off, eager to fight the savage monster, either death approached or fame's reward, promising small gifts, not unwelcome or in vain, she made her prayers to the gods with closed lips. Now, as a storm uproots a quivering branch of oak, 
or a cone-bearing pine with resinous bark, on the heights of Mount Taurus, twisting its unconquered strength in the wind, it falls headlong, far off, plucked out by the roots, shattering anything and everything in its way. So Theseus upended the cornered body of the beast, its useless horns overthrown, emptied of breath. Then he turned back, unharmed, to great glory, guided by the wandering track of fine thread, so that his exit from the fickle labyrinth of the palace would not be prevented by some unnoticed error. This passage continues next episode with the homecoming of Theseus and Ariadne's curse. <laughs>